So I think the real truth <clears throat> is I'm not good enough to make it in the starting lineup, so I just come to pinch hit. But hopefully we'll swing for the fence and it'll still be good for you. Um, <clears throat> so just so it's not totally boring on me, I'm, I'm gonna maybe do this a little different than I, than I did the last couple times I've come. Um, I'm gonna have it a little more interactive and a little maybe less of me just talking the whole time. So um, I wanted to start today by asking you guys why you signed up for this particular class or lecture series. So. We knew you'd be here. <laughs> you didn't know I was gonna be here. <laughs> like really, why, why, why was this something? Just an easy credit? That might be some of your answer. Um, as someone who's always kind of thinking of different routes to take in life, this is a great opportunity to hear from personal perspectives, why you do what you do, do you enjoy it? Because I mean, it's a lot to pick what career you want to go to, um, especially for oftentimes your entire life at such yeah. an early age. So it, it, ju it definitely helps to have some Yeah, insight. just some exposure, some yeah. different things. That's actually a really good one, because I, I, like uh, Landon said, I actually graduated as a school teacher. I taught high school. And, and I didn't do a lot of that. Like, I, I kind of just went whatever route I it seemed like something that uh, was interesting at the time, and I just went that way. I had teachers that impacted me, and so I was going to go impact others, right? That, that's what, and I didn't really explore different ideas, different things. And man, is my life taking me a totally different route. And there's a lot of things out there to do than what you necessarily think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just familiarity. I've taken Landon's classes before. I'm used to seeing my professor. Cool. Awesome. Great. So you're an entrepreneur minded guy if you're doing Landon's classes? Uh, man, major, but okay. Good, good. in the direction that are going in the direction or, or have achieved the goals and things that you want to, to achieve and they have the experience and the knowledge that you want to gain and, and it's inevitable that at some point or another you'll pick up a few okay. things that will kind of Good. rub off in my own life. So just putting yourself in situations to glean things from others yeah, that, um, that, have, that, that, have, that have been successful and hopefully you can implement them. Great. Anybody else got anything of why you, why you signed up for this class? The rest uh, all thought it was an easy A. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll maybe start then by giving you a little bit of background of myself, and then I want you to, to pick my brain today. Like I want you to not just uh, to come and have to listen to what I say, but I want to give you something that maybe hopefully is valuable, that, that, that is beneficial to you. So I'll give you a little background so you kind of have uh, a little bit of understanding of, of who I am and, and what I've done, <clears throat> and then I want you to ask questions, okay? So like Lana said, I started as a school teacher. Um, my motivation truly was I had a couple of teachers in high school that really impacted me, and I wanted to, to go and, and, uh, and hopefully do the same for, for others. And I loved teaching. I absolutely loved teaching. Um, I hated the bureaucracy of, of uh, the school district. And, and kind of what tipped me away from it is I, I remember we had our first kid and my wife decided that she was gonna stay home. And so it was just my measly $26,000 a year salary is all that we had as income. And, and I thought, okay, I, I'm gonna go get my master's degree and then I'll make more to be able to provide for my family better, right? So I went and started researching master's degree programs and realized it would have cost me $10,000 in student loans and it would have increased my salary by $1,000. That didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. <laughs> um, and so I'd, I'd grown up doing construction, so my background from when I, well, even from when I was little, my, my parents' attitude <clears throat> in raising us was the only thing they ever paid for was shoes and underwear. I, I literally bought my own school clothes. I, if I wanted to do anything with my friends, I had to, to have the money to go do it. Um, all of those things I had to pay for growing up. So when I was old enough, I got a job with a contractor when I was 14, one of those old school contractors that we, we built houses from ground up. So I know how to dig footings, pour cement, frame, do electrical plumbing. I, I can literally build a house from start to finish. And I've used that skill um, a ton through my life. I calculated one time and just in what I've saved in being able to, to know those trades, it's close to $2 million that I've saved by doing work myself over, over the course of my life. Um, so I'm super valuable for that experience. So when I was teaching school, 
I was still kind of doing that on the side, so that was my summer gig. I'd find an old house, I'd fix it up, we'd keep it as a rental or flip it. Um, and so I'd ha I was kind of starting to dabble in the real estate world. So when I realized that uh, the cost-benefit analysis of a master's degree didn't make a lot of sense, then I, I jumped to real estate and started selling houses for a living. Um, did that for <clears throat> a couple years. Um, I was, I've always uh, been super blessed in that, that realm, so I, I then opened my own brokerage a few years after that. One of the things you'll notice of my story is I kind of struggle doing the same thing for a long period of time. I get bored and I have to change and do something else. So I started a brokerage. Um, that uh, Stratum Real Estate is the name of that company. We now have um, almost 100 agents in, uh, in three different offices um, in the state. Um, so we still own that. And then I one day was actually looking for a place to build or to, to move my office. It had grown and I wanted to buy a building to, to house our, our real estate brokerage in. And I got talking to the city's economic development guy and he said, you know, I don't know of anything like that, but you ought to go talk to this guy. Doug Nell was his name. Um, he's selling some stuff downtown. He has a bunch of property downtown. And so that led me on a, a journey that I didn't expect, that idea of you have no idea really what's out there. All of a sudden I owned two hotels and started accumulating a, 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 about a six and a half acres around the corner of Center and Main Street. So I own that area of Bristlecone, uh, the winery, Park Place Eatery, that whole block right there is, is the property that we own. Um, so that took me, it took me about, uh, from the day we bought it, we closed on Christmas Eve, 2012. Um, and it took me about 10 years to accumulate the whole block. And, and we've just tried to revitalize it as we've gone. You might have noticed some demo. We're going to start a new hotel and a parking structure on it. Um, and then we've been converting other stuff to apartments. And we'll build a couple other buildings and have a really cool outdoor plaza in the middle of the block that will be a great gathering place for the community. So. Um, so that's kind of, kind of what I've done. I've done a lot of development stuff as well. Um, I, I market for a couple of builders, um, have five uh, large development projects that I market for throughout the state. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> that's kind of my background from now you know what I've done. Um, so now start asking me questions. So how have you ridden the waves of uncertainty with real estate and how do you counter that with being able to have stuff more consistently flowing in? Yeah, great question, because real estate definitely does this, right? So I got into it and it was just starting on an up cycle, which was actually kind of lucky. <laughs> sometimes you're, you're good, sometimes you're just lucky. I was lucky that I kind of rid the first up cycle and I built a great client base. Um, and since that, my second year in the industry, I've been, now been doing it 18 years, I've never docked a door, I've never prospected. Everything that I do on the individual sales side has all come just from referrals. So, um, so I think a big part of, and I would apply this to any business that you choose to go into, if you're the best at what you do and you truly care about people as you do it, you can ride any kind of a market. Um, I grew every year, even in the down cycle when agents were getting out by the hundreds, I grew my business every year, even in the down cycle. No, great question. So that's, uh, that's me speaking specifically about real estate sales, right? That part of the business. Um, because I, I, was, I worked hard to be good at what I did, and I genuinely care about people and did my very best to make sure they were always put first and the money follows. That's, I, I believe that very strongly. In anything you do, if you're chasing money and the dollar is what drives you, you're not going to be happy. You may be successful if you're talented, and, and you may be, but you're not going to be happy. If dollars are what drive you, um, reevaluate your life. <laughs> that is not where you're going to find actual happiness. So, but the second part of that question is, yes, I have over the years focused on the concept. Um, in fact, those two are tied, kind of tied together. I'll tell you a story. So I'm, I'm a religious person. I served a mission for the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and the, my mission president, my second mission president, was a venture capitalist. He'd taken like five companies public. He was uber wealthy. And I go into my, my interview to, when I was coming home from my mission, and he never talked to me about going home and getting married. He didn't talk to me about go home and read your scriptures and pray every day. He talked about business and money for two hours with me. 
And the foundation of that that I have implemented into the way I've approached business was that if, if you are seeking to do good with what resources the Lord blesses you with, then he'll bless you with them. Um, it, and I believe that principle very strongly. So, uh, so that, that's what drove me. So on my 18-hour plane home, 18 hour plane ride home from Australia, I started setting goals, financial goals, things that I was going to achieve. And part of that was he talked to me about the idea of passive income versus um, just working, right? And, and so I started setting goals of buying rental houses. I was gonna, by the time I was 35 years old, I was gonna have enough money that I could live on it and not have to work. Um, I, was, I was 34 when I achieved that. So, so you can do it, but, but I believe that that was only possible, not because of what I did, but because I truly have tried to put others first in the way that I do things. He read in my bio, it's huge to me to give back in the community. Like I've, I've uh, coached soccer teams, I'm the club president, I'm in the Lions Club, I started to help found the charter school. Um, I always am involved in trying to give back, and I believe if your focus is giving more than you take, then the, the blessings just come, you just receive it. But yes, on the other side of it, I have constantly invested in passive income as well. So I work really hard in my profession, and I, and I use that as the best capital generator you can have. A lot of people get into, I was meeting with the doctor um, a couple weeks ago, that he was talking about this passive investing stuff. He wanted to get into passive investing. But he has no money. He, he hasn't focused on his business to grow his practice to where it generates the extra income that then he can build passive income with. People wanna go and just invest and get the lazy money that comes from passive income. It's a fallacy. You have to work your guts out at being good at a profession that then generates the income to build the passive. But, but uh, the passive is awesome when you can get it. So, so yes, I've always done that over the years. From even when I was teaching school, um, we'd, we'd, our first house, for example, and this is, in, this is, you want a little tidbit on the real estate side, if any of you are interested in real estate. Many of you think about your first house and putting a roof over your head, and you think about having what your parents have. Get it out. That's the stupidest thing you can do is put yourself in a high house payment. First house you should buy should be a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex. Why? You can, you can, up to a fourplex, you can still get a USDA 100% finance loan and you can own four units. You don't get married because now your wife is tied into you. But if you well, I'll disagree with the, yeah, I disagree with the married part. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like marriage personally, but. If you have your girlfriend or fiance, if you're that serious, buy one first. So then you have two. Then you can get two, ones. yeah. Well, you can even do that actually when you're married. You, did you, real estate, you don't have to own the assets can, together. You can actually get loans in separate But you things. do that while the market is heating up, not when it's cooling off. So I'm never getting married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so honestly, think of it that way. Like the first house we bought was an old beater house in the heart of town that I gutted the entire thing, put an apartment in the basement, and we lived upstairs. The downstairs rent paid our mortgage. I lived for free. Then we took that capital and we put it into another rental. So, so be smart with your first purchase. And, and what you said is actually true. Um, yeah, put those up. So the, the way real estate works, if you're interested in real estate, where are the pen things at? Good question. There's one on the end of Oh, there's one. So this is super important to realize too, for those that may be interested in the real estate side of what I do. You can look at, at real estate data and it looks like this. So the Real Estate Association has been keeping track of data since the 1970s. And real estate does this. There's always a peak and always a valley. So when you hear people talk about real estate always appreciates, it's a lie. Over time, yeah, it always appreciates. But there's always downturns. Always downturns. The average of these, again, statistical averages, so some of them are extended, but from the bottom, to go to the peak is about five years. From the peak to the valley is about five years. So 
it's really important when you do buy your first piece of real estate, if that's something that you want to do and, and think about real estate investing, you have to understand that where you're at in the cycle. Because if you buy here, you're waiting 10, 15 years before your house actually appreciates. Does that make sense? So super important to know where you're at in the cycle when you buy. Where are we at in the cycle right now? We're just on the way down. So we peaked um, in Cedar City. The, the medium income in June of last year was kind of the peak um, at $410,000 was the median sales price in Cedar City. That's just stupidly high. Um, we're now down to about 375, 370 is where our median sales price is right now. So we're just starting this down cycle. Our last up cycle was extended. So it was actually closer to 10 years of an up cycle. It was about nine and a half. Um, so it was, a, it was an extended average on the up last time. Yes, so we'll go here and then here. The future, I mean, every crash, no crash is the same. Correct. So if you were to say like, just hypothetically, you know, I mean, it, what do you think would be the cause of it? Um, oversupply is always the cause of it. But right. What causes the oversupply changes. But real estate, when, you, when you're looking at real estate and if you, when you go to buy, this is how I would tell you to interview your real estate agent, okay? If they don't understand data, they suck, go find somebody else. Because if they're not a professional about understanding the data, don't trust their advice. They're just wanting to sell you something and make a commission. If they can't give you actual data, go find somebody else. Okay, so understanding the cycles is number one. The second part of that is when you get into the micro level, you can predict also what's happening by looking at, at inventory numbers. So you take the ratio between the number of homes that sell per year, divide it into the active homes that are on the market, and it gives you a months of inventory is what I call it. So if there's 60 homes, or 10 homes that sell a month, and there's 60 homes on the market, you have six months of inventory. A stable market will have between four to five months of inventory. So meaning there's enough buyers for the homes that are there that prices hold relatively flat. You get below that, you get down two, three months. When we, when we spike very, the very peak of our last cycle, we were at point two months of inventory. So two weeks, <laughs> less than two weeks of inventory. Whereas the last crash, which was the big one, that was a, so most cycles don't drop 50, 60% like we did in 2009 through 2013. Uh, most of them would be more like a 20% on average. That was a big crash. Um, but we were at 18 months of inventory when the world fell apart in 2009. So it just kind of shows you that supply and demand. Where are we at right now with that? What is the Great question. Time? About three months. So and is it slowing? Is yeah. It the, trend, the trend is that the inventory is increasing, which that's why this is just starting to, to do its tip. Yeah, but that's what's also keeping it relatively still high and why this inventory number is staying still at, th at a decent number is you're not getting a whole bunch of resale inventory on the market because you're not gonna sell your 3% mortgage, no. right? You have to have a real reason to move in order to, to sell your 3% mortgage. So most of the, your, your normal uh, new construction segment of the market is typically about 5% of the homes is new construction. We're at almost 20% of the homes is new construction right now. So that's a, a big part of it. Sorry, yeah, you were next. When you're like, getting that first house, that duplex, that triplex or fourplex, would you recommend going into it with like an FHA loan or just going for 20% loan? Like I would recommend whatever makes sense financially to more than cover you, to actually have it be an investment, okay. right? Buying real estate is not an investment. Buying cash flowing real estate is an investment. So, so you, you'll have people that'll preach the theory of appreciation or deductions that you can write off against your other income and then that makes it an investment. No, it's not. If you're not actually generating revenue off it every month, those other things are like the cherry on top that you get some appreciation and can write some stuff off on your taxes. If you're not making money every month, it's not an investment. Because guaranteed you're gonna need to replace the roof at some point. <laughs> You're, you're going to have a, a plumbing problem. You're going to have something wrong with it that if you, don't, if you haven't been profitable in it, then it can actually take you out. So, good. Oh, I got lots of hands. I love it. So, this question kind of shifts away from this, but what are some of the healthy and unhealthy habits that you developed that either helped you or hindered you from achieving your financial success? Mm -hmm. Great question. So, I've kind of articulated them. We have a, 
a family model that just kind of developed when I started having kids. Um, the Nelsons work hard, we're kind, and we don't quit. So I, I attribute those three things as kind of what embodies the habits or the things that I think are important. Um, if you don't know how to work, you're not going to be successful. If you do, it's like you won the lottery and you got lucky, but you're, the chances of it are almost nil. And I'll be honest with you, as an employer, there's a whole lot of people your age that don't know how to work. <laughs> I, I turn through guys on, I've got a construction crew, um, and, and we cannot find and hire people that are younger and have them consistently show up every day and work hard. We can't find them. That, that's a big problem, because everybody wants the easy buck. They want to have what mom and dad have without working like mom and dad worked to get it. That's a huge problem. So that's the number one. As you decide you want to do something, be committed to get up, in, get up early, show up, work hard while you're there, and then go have fun. <laughs> right? but, but life isn't all about fun. You, you've got to develop those kind of habits. So when, um, when I'm preparing to buy my first home, whether it be mm -hmm. duplex, triplex, quadplex, what are the things that I should establish in my life first to make sure that I don't, like, just make sure it doesn't, like, crash into financial ruin? It's like yeah. getting a loan for, what, quadplex now? Oh, yeah. Like 800 grand, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. like, how can I prepare without just having half a million dollars in savings to make sure that I don't, I can make the payments every time. So like how Well, in general, in general I would just say you've got to learn how to actually discipline yourself financially. So um, I'm extreme, so what I'm going to share with some of these things, I'm not expecting that this is the norm, but just to give you an idea of my approach to finances. Again, money is not what brings me happiness, and I don't think it really buys, brings anybody happiness. Um, so we often think that the toys that we have, the cool car that we drive, that's a big one. Don't ever buy a new car. That is the stupidest financial decision you can make is to buy a new car. If you actually care about d developing any kind of wealth, never buy a new car. I drove a scooter. Literally, when I was teaching school and coaching, I taught at the Alternative High School and then I coached out at Canyon View, and I would get the, f people would just point and laugh at me. But I would be in the snow, ball bag, med kit, my school bag over my shoulders, my helmet, in the snow driving from work to practice, right? Two o'clock in the morning coming home from a, a long road trip in my scooter, in the winter, right? But it was fantastic. It got like 50 miles to the gallon. I put a dollar in it a week, you know? <laughs> Didn't have any payment on it, right? That, those kinds of decisions allow you to, to save money that then you can use to build wealth. But if you put your wealth into boats and cars and and trips and you know things that that don't generate any kind of long-term wealth you set yourself way behind financially way behind financially so then we'll go here then over here help me keep track and then there so i know you've kind of touched on that a little bit but how would someone beginning start to learn and start to get involved in, in the financial real estate stuff like that um it's a good question so uh, find somebody who does it that is actually successful at it okay. not just uh, a person that sells real estate but somebody that invests in real estate um, to help you be a mentor finding a good mentor I think is super valuable um, but otherwise it's it's what I just taught you is all you really need to know like figure out the data and watch those cycles so that when you see this cycle go here and you just are starting to then shrink inventory. So let's say this drops to seven, eight months of inventory, and now it starts to shrink to five. Now you know that the market is bottoming out and it's gonna start going up. So pay attention to the data and try, if possible, to buy towards the bottom of that. And you'll never nail it perfect, but as long as you're in this range, you'll be okay. Good question, who is second next? Okay. What are some like lessons that you learned on your mission that made you like a better like businessman? Like, um, great question. So I think the, the organizational side that the, the church tries to get missionaries to follow, to plan, to 
to think about goals and, and what you want to do, I think is super valuable that if you can carry that through your life, it's huge. I still have um, a book that I can go back from when I got home off my mission till now that yearly my wife and my kids now, we all sit down and we write new goals and they go in the book, right? So, so having something you're actually working towards is huge and that, that's a skill that I, I think I learned on my mission. Um, and what that does for you, why I think that's so important, let's say you are tempted, your guy just loves trucks. I like, I drive a truck now. Still bought it, you know, 10 years old and, and I, I use it as a truck, it's not fancy, but I, I wanted to have a truck, I actually use it. Um, but when you're tempted to buy that new truck, but you have a goal to save X number of dollars in order to have a down payment for the next rental, then it helps you to, to not buy the new truck, right? Because you have a goal of something that's more long lasting of importance. So I think goals are huge. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, how long were you in like crippling debt? I have, um, well, I'll take that back. I've never been in crippling debt because I, I don't, I've never practiced the idea of, of leverage at a high, high level. I have leverage, and there's two theories. Oh, there's the Dave Ramsey theory that sometimes I look at. I, my, my partner in sales, so I have a partner that helps me on my sales side of my business. She does, has done it opposite than me. She'll work really hard. She'll save her two, three hundred thousand dollars. She'll go buy a rental. <laughs> she'll work really hard. She'll save her two, three hundred thousand dollars. She'll go buy another rental. Um, so that's how she's developed hers, where I did a little bit more of the leverage side, but I never, I never put myself in such debt that I was ever uh, felt like I was over leveraged. Now, now I'll add one caveat to that. When we started buying the property downtown, when we bought it, we felt like it was fine. But when we were running two hotels and COVID hit, and all of a sudden your income went to almost zero, any debt was scary at that point, <laughs> right? But that was a kind of a, a thing that was hard to, to plan for or, or deal with. We're now to the stage where we aren't doing any more debt. So. I still have a little bit um, that we consolidated into one loan on our downtown property, but it is like maybe an eighth of the total value of the property, so it's like a really small amount compared to, to what the asset is. What do you think were some of the biggest lessons that the market took away from 2008, 2009? The lending world learned a lot of good lessons. A big part of the, the market crash at that time was people that shouldn't get loans were getting loans. And so then when all those people couldn't pay, right, because they, they really were over leveraged, that flooded the market with inventory that, that drove prices down. Yeah, yeah, well it was all tied together. The mortgage-backed securities market was what drove that. And then, and so it was all tied still to people getting mortgages that shouldn't have gotten mortgages. It was a huge part of it. Okay, yeah, there. So this is one of the weird parts about me that my wife harasses me on. I am not an avid reader. Um, I read, when I first got back off my mission, one of the books that my mission president told me to read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read that one. I have read The Richest Man in Babylon. Um, I think has some good things in that one. Um, but in general, I'm kind of weird. I just, I have my core principles that I believe in and then I just get up every day and go to work. And, and along the way, I may pick up some things, but I, in general, really do believe if you just go work hard, you'll be successful. I, I, I don't meet anybody that that wouldn't fall into. So when you're talking about looking at this data, where, where am I going to go? So great question. In Utah, you have to call a real estate agent. So, um, so the data, they're the only organization that keeps track of the data is the Real Estate Association. So, so you got to call a realtor. What else? For someone with not a huge financial uh, portfolio, what would be some good steps to take uh, to get to the point where we can have the cash flow to pay for something like this? I mean, I know you said work hard, but like um, potentially like a real estate agent that is like inexpensive or something, because I know they've worked hard to get to the point and you don't want to undervalue them. But do you have any like tips for that? Or? Um. I really think it's as simple as you work your guts out, you save, <laughs> and then find the right person to help you. One of the, and that's just coming from a real estate professional, but one of the things I do think people are a little short-sighted of is finding somebody who knows the market is worth paying them to have help you. 
right? Having a really good accountant is worth me paying the accountant to help me save on taxes. Right? Now, if I get a crappy accountant, I'd be better off doing it myself. If I get a crappy real estate agent, then I'd be better off just doing it myself. But if you find somebody who really knows and understands an industry, it's typically worth paying for them. Um, so I don't know if that was part of your question, but outside of that, it really is work hard and save, and then find the right people that, that are experts to help give you good, solid advice that aren't in it for their own selfish reasons, but that, that are really, truly wanting to help you. So go back here, then we'll come over here, and then back to here. Yeah. Who is back here? Okay. So did you like find the business owners and then they were like, hey, this is kind of my need and you built like the building? Great question. So commercial is its own animal. It's very different than residential. Um, in a residential, many of you probably lease. Um, if you, your water heater breaks, who do you call? The landlord, right? The property management company that then deals with it. Um, in commercial, it's actually a little different. So in commercial, um, which I love commercial because of this, you're basically just saying, hey, I own, happen to own this box, but whatever you want to do to it, that's up to you. Because when you leave, the next guy may want to do something completely different. It's not going to still be a house, right? The, it, bristle cones in there now, and when they leave, it may be a gym that wants to move in, right? So they'll rip all the kitchen stuff out. So I'm not going to spend money to put kitchen in. Um, because my next tenant may not want it. So, so what I, I was just super selective with the types of tenants I wanted and they had to be well capitalized to do their own build out so that I didn't have high turnover. I wanted those, those businesses to be long term type businesses. So, so that's how I structured them. So you put up the yep, building shell is basically there in commercial and then the tenant does it whatever they want to to it. And they have to maintain it and fix the heater when it goes bad and um, it's their problem, it's their space. Yeah, that's why, but commercial is awesome. It's harder to get into commercial. You have to, I mean, there's no zero or FHA, three and a half percent type financing. You've gotta have a minimum 20% down. You have to show strong financials. It's harder to get into commercial, but it's great when you can get there. Uh, if you could go back to like our age, mm -hmm. Ooh, I have, I have thought about that one before. If I would do anything differently, um, I can answer that honestly uh, that I don't think I would because I learned from even the things that maybe weren't the, the smartest. Like um, one of the funny ones is when I got back off my mission because I had this mission president that inspired me about business, I actually switched my degree to be a business major. <laughs> I took one accounting class and I was like, uh, if that's what business is, I'm out. And, and I switched back to teaching. Um, so I sometimes wonder if I should have just stuck with business and I might have gotten down that road a little quicker, but then I wouldn't have probably picked up the houses on the side while I was teaching because that was a perfect job for me to be able to go at 3.30 and I could work until 10 o'clock fixing a house up and, and had my weekends free and um, so, so yeah, I, I don't know if, if I would change anything. Um, yeah, it's a good question though. Sorry, that's probably not the answer you wanted. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give your like, younger self knowing that, like, someone our age? What advice would you give us? The earlier you can figure out those key things that I've already talked about, about just buckling down and embracing the fact that work is good um, and saving like crazy. If those two things you can do, have you ever, has anybody ever played the Rich Dad Poor Dad game Cash Flow? Okay, if you haven't, it's actually a fun game to play too, like my kids just like to play it, it's, it's fun. It's way better than the, the chance of Monopoly that is just all the roll of the dice. Um, but it teaches uh, a lot of the principles that I think are valuable for you to, to understand about what really is an investment, what isn't an investment. Um, and think about those things maybe at a young age so that you're not 50. Because one of the things I love about that game that is really true, because um, I've had a cool gig with IHC that anytime they recruit a doctor, I give them a tour of the community and try to help their wife, because usually the wife that doesn't want to live here because we don't have enough stores or whatever. Um, I try to help them convince them to move here. So I, I as my clients, I have probably about 80% of the doctors in town have, are, are my clients as well. 
And <clears throat> in the game and in real life, a janitor can get out of the rat race faster, can get to where they're uh, generating more passive income than their expenses than a doctor can. And sometimes it's just because that janitor has less resources, so he's more wise about how he's spending them and saving them versus the doctor that they went to be a doctor because they were gonna be rich. So therefore they get out of med school and they immediately buy the million dollar house and they buy two new cars and because they can, they can afford it. And then they're poorer longer because they're still living paycheck to paycheck, just like the janitor is, um, versus um, if they can be smart. So one of my, I have one partner on my downtown development. He's a doctor and he was the opposite. He got out of med school and he still drove his old purple you know, Ford minivan, and they, they bought the smallest home they could buy that would fit their, their family. And now he's retired at 47 and has multi-million dollars in rental properties personally, plus all the stuff we have together. Because he lived way cheap and, and took all that extra and invested it. So that's a, there was somebody back there first. Yeah, right there. <laughs> it's a great question, and yes, if there's uh, people that actually know how to work, I'll always put them to work. Um, so I have uh, Steve Greenhall's the name of my co contractor that runs my crew, um, and you're always welcome to go over, do you know where Bristlecone and stuff is, and then there's all that demo that happened behind it, that that's where the new hotel is being built, and then there's a, a, an older uh, hotel that we're converting to apartments, uh, we call it Midtown, Cedar Sports has now moved into the lobby of it. So I have a, an office right there in, in unit 107 that you're welcome to go stop by and, and talk to. Okay, then I was coming down here and then we'll go back up here. So you're pretty heavily invested in real estate from my understanding? Definitely, I have like 70 grand in the stock market. That's it, I hate the stock really? market. Yeah. So what makes you, because my dad, he has a real estate there, but he always teaches me, he's like, never have your eggs one basket. Totally. Yeah. And I think that is what uh, investment people that want you to invest in the stock market tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so also, um, as far as incorporating your real estate, because obviously it was held personally at one point, and mm -hmm. then you probably made a small business and moved that into a corporation. Yeah, we've got what multiple LLCs. Tax benefits that came off of that, and how is that? Oh, it's awesome. Like the, the depreciation you get off of real estate is phenomenal. This, and this is why, I, so there's two reasons of why I'm heavy in real estate and I don't do anything else. Is um, I don't think there's a better investment, number one. Something that generates you monthly income, appreciates in value, and gives you tax write-offs every year. Does the stock market do that? I mean, on all my losses, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of losses. Yeah, I get to depreciate it 27.5% uh, of the value of my property every year when I own a property. So, so there's no way, there's not, no other investment that can give you all three of those. Now, real estate doesn't give you that if you buy here, right? Then your appreciation is a lot longer to, to gain and you can see some losses. Um, but that's, that's one of the reasons. The other reason of why I'm heavy in real estate is the con one of the concepts in uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. If, you have, if you're good at something, if you know something, don't give your money to somebody else and hope that they know what they're doing. Right? So even the people that I know that have done well in the stock market, they typically study it themselves and are, and are professionals themselves at the way that they invest, not just throwing it in mutual funds and letting it hope that it, it appreciates. I can actually show you with mutual funds how you can have a 10% average growth and lose money. Mathematically, if it goes down 50%, does it take 50% to get back to the same place? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not a big fan of, of those. You had one there and then back here. Um, at, at what point, this is like a too facet question, at what point would you recommend bringing a property management company or property manager into your real estate? Great business? question. So you, would you also recommend doing that construction, like learning construction, all that? Yes. So one of the things that you asked if I would do something different the main thing I've done that if I hadn't done, I would have done different was learn trades. When you're younger, if you learn how to do stuff in construction, it is unbelievable the amount of money you can save just by being able to go do it. So in the time that you're maybe don't have a lot, now, now I don't do as much of that, I still do. I, I'm still the guy that goes and wires the panels at, at my renovation project right now at the hotel. Um, 
because I know how to do it better than my general does. And it's a lot cheaper than hiring. These electricians are super expensive. <laughs> um, so I would learn trades. Go, go get a job, learn how to work by working in construction and learn that trade and it will save you buco. And then honestly, if, you're, if you ever have a hard time, just to give you an idea, the construction industry, the average age of construction workers is like 55 years old. Average. So there are no young people in it. So I'm actually encouraging my third son is kind of mechanically inclined. I'm encouraging him to go be a plumber or electrician. I'll guarantee you he'll make more as much money as a doctor does. Because there are so few people that are doing it that the, the ability to make money in it is huge, 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 huge. So I definitely do that. Back in the back. Uh, two questions. First of all, what's the name of that game you mentioned? Cash flow. Okay. Um, the other one, uh, talking about goals, we talked a lot about how you learn to set goals in mission. What types of goals are you setting? Are you setting like uh, short-term and really long-term uh, goals? Yep, both. Yep. So when, I, when, you, when you look at my page that we do every year, we have short-term ones, things that we're just accomplishing during that year and even sometimes uh, in a month-by-month -month type basis. And then we also have long-term goals of what we want to, to get to. So I do both and I do them in different categories. So again, if money is all that drives you, you're never gonna be happy. But I believe that if you seek to help others and then you pursue wealth, that you'll be blessed with the wealth because then you're gonna do something good with it, right? Um, I didn't answer your question, just remember too. Property managers, I hate them. I try not to hire them because they never will do as good with your property as you will. So there was a time that we were so busy, I hired one and they allowed pets in it. Like they just, they're disgustingly gross. They put in the first person that walks in the door because they're incentivized just to be able to get rent. And then they, they're terrible. So, so I have never, outside of that little time period, I've never hired a property manager. I now have one because I have over 150 doors that works for me personally and he only manages my stuff so that I can control it better, so, yeah. How often do you work and how much free time do you have? Ah, great question. So one of the risks of approaching life the way that I do is when you, when you put a high value on work, you sometimes can get out of balance. And I've had that happen to me in my life. I've definitely had times where I was working 80 hours a week um, I, I never saw my family. Uh, when I was first getting real estate going, you know, somebody called me and it was on the 4th of July or Christmas Eve, I was showing them houses, right? Because that paycheck was important at the time. Um, so you do have to be careful when you embrace the idea of, of work like I have that you keep yourself in balance. So um, I have not always been good at it is the honest answer to that question. I'm much better at it now, but there was a time in, in my life uh, and maybe this, this is a, maybe a little bit of a vulnerable one, but just to give you the realities of, like Landon said, I am who I am. I don't, I don't have any pretenses. There was actually a time when we had bought the hotel in that downtown property. Um, we actually lost our brand with Best Western. And so um, we, we were worried a little bit financially. And there was actually a time I remember sitting in my truck uh, outside the hotel. And I thought, you know what? If I just drive up the canyon and drive off the cliff, my family's gonna be better off. Like I was that out of balance, right? I was that low that I, and lost perspective. And I kicked it out, I'm a naturally happy person, but, but even me who's a very positive person, if you're not careful, you can get into that kind of a place that's unhealthy. Um, so you, that's it. I'm actually glad you brought that up. Thank you. How much of that unbalance led to your benefit of where you're at now though? Does that make sense? It does. Even though you were unbalanced working 80 hours a week, 90 hours, it was too much, how much of it still led to the success that you might not have attained? Uh, I, I would agree. I don't think the success would have not happened when I look back on it. Maybe I wouldn't have been there quite as fast, um, but it was unhealthy still, right? So I, I, looking back on it, outside of college, that is the thing I probably would have changed at times in my life is is to still have fun. I, I, my brother-in-law said to me one time when I was kind of in the middle of that, he, a really honest, sometimes family can prick you to the heart with what they say. He said, you know what, Steve? You're a lot more tig or a lot more rabbit and a lot less tigger now. Because <laughs> I used to be just the fun guy. Yeah? I just I enjoyed people. I loved doing stuff. And I got so into work that I lost that side of me. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a fair point, but I still think it's un, if it's unhealthy, 
you should still figure out how to be healthy and the success will still come. The, 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 like, would it have really mattered if it took me an extra five years to, to get there? No, <laughs> it wouldn't have. So, yeah. Um, so when looking at real estate, what are like the, inv the advantages or disadvantages of like building a new home? Ah, uh, great question. Or finding one that's like already ready? Yeah, great question. So in general, new construction is on average historically been about 10% higher than, than resale homes. So if you're not doing any of the work and you're just truly buying a new home versus a resale home, always buy a resale home um, is the answer to that. Now, I shouldn't say always. There was a time when inventory was so low, that point two months of inventory, people having to wait for new construction was actually a negative and there was at a short period of time where resales sold higher than new construction because they were available then. So there's a few little oddities like that, but, but you shouldn't be buying in that kind of market anyway. You really should just keep renting and save. Yeah, Great question. question. Time for one more question. All right, one more. First hand I see. Boom. Uh, what would be your tips or advice for somebody that's just starting out in the real estate sales world? as far as getting the first couple clients and getting started? Uh, great. So the, the average real estate agent, and this, is, this has gone up probably in the last few years and I haven't looked up the new stat, but forever the average real estate agent made about $26,000 a year, which means there's a whole lot of people that try it and make almost nothing. And then there's a small percentage of people that do really well at it. Um, the difference that I've seen in those people comes down to my base principle, those that are willing to work. I've got a kid right now that joined our brokerage about six months ago and not a lot of contacts. He, he wasn't from here. He didn't have relationships to leverage, um, but he was willing to work. And he shows up every day and he gets on the phone and he makes cold calls. He goes and knocks doors and he finds people that are uh, because of his hard work. And he is now closing about one a month which is great for a new agent that's only been doing it six months. But he, he was willing to work. A lot of people get into it and think, oh, the people just come to me and it's easy money. You have to still work. Now, once you generate that first pool, you have to have in your mind, how am I gonna stay in contact with these people and help them know I care about them? Um, and if you figure out a system to do that, then those people start feeding you. And within a year to two years, you don't have to prospect anymore because you have enough of that repeat business coming. But you have to have a system on how to stay in contact with them and build those relationships strong. So good question. Okay, okay that's it. Thanks,